written is full of magnificent examples of architectural and engineering genius. And it stands testament to the men who actually constructed it all, and of course the architects and the engineers who designed it. From great Norman cathedrals like Ely and Peterborough, right through to the Houses of Parliament, we're going to be looking at mighty symbols of the progress that was made in construction and engineering over the centuries. What all these buildings have in common is the great range of craft skills that went into designing, building and decorating them. If it wasn't for their workmanship, their hard graft and their ingenuity, we wouldn't have the glorious buildings that still dominate our country today. This is the story of the craftsmen and their ingenious methods who spent all their working lives through the last thousand years dedicated to the building of Britain. Believe it or not, this is a cathedral. This is the Saxon Cathedral of St Peter's in Bradwell-on-Sea in Essex. It was built 1,300 years ago, using stones from the remains of an old Roman fort that had stood on this spot. It's the only Saxon cathedral in the country that still survives intact. It is very big, is it? It must be all 50 foot long by 25 foot wide. In fact, it's so small it would fit in my back garden. Before the Norman conquest, most Saxon churches were small like this. But then in 1066, William the Conqueror defeated King Harold at the Battle of Hastings and everything changed. <laughs> After the conquest, the Normans began to build on a scale that had never been seen before. They erected huge stone castles to assert their power and authority. And work began on a whole series of massive cathedrals around the country. These cathedrals weren't just built as a tribute to God. The Normans didn't want to leave anybody in any doubt about who was in charge down here on Earth. What distinguishes the great Norman cathedrals from the Saxon buildings that they replaced is the great size and scale of them. And of course the Normans brought with them from France when they arrived here all the building techniques that we see here today. I mean these magnificent, beautiful pillars and fine arches. needed a massive labour force to construct buildings of this size and the Normans who more or less press ganged the Anglo-Saxons into doing all the labouring. It must have been bad enough being conquered by them, never mind doing all the donkey work as well. And the work was on such a different scale than anything they'd ever done before. These were like the largest buildings in England at the time. Strength and simplicity are the main features of this style of building. It's based on very thick walls, which gave the whole thing quite a chunky look. This huge expansion in the building trade led us to the building of some of our most magnificent cathedrals. One or two haven't changed since the day they were built, but the majority of them have been added to and messed about with over the centuries. This is Peterborough, and it's a good example of what I mean. This wonderful west front was added at the beginning of the 13th century, nearly 150 years after the Norman conquest. 
But once you get inside Peterborough, you can see it's one of the finest and purest Norman cathedrals in all of England. And here, standing in the main crossing, with its magnificent three tiers of Norman arches, complete with chevrons and fancy bits, you get a real feeling of what Norman cathedrals are really all about. It's nearly 500 feet long and just slightly over 200 feet wide. And to the top of the tower, it's 143 feet. The wall place gives you a feeling of something permanent and solid. These three tiers of rounded arches resting on magnificent stone pillars. The great columns that support all the arches are not built of solid masonry, but as tubes filled with rubble. A tube has more rigidity, and it's lighter than a solid pillar, and it's quicker, cheaper, and easier to build. When you look around on the surface of some of the stones, there's these interesting mason's marks, and the modern stone masons even use them to this day. And in a way, it's a signature of the man who actually made that particular stone. And if there's any rough workmanship, I suppose they could, they could nail him. <laughs> the thing is that when the place was built, you know, you wouldn't be able to see any, uh, any of these marks because the whole place were heavily lime-washed and painted. You know, an example of which can be seen just up there. The Normans built with semicircular or round arches, just like the Romans used to do. And of course, that's why sometimes they're called Norman and sometimes they're called Romanesque. The arch really is, is the, the main thing about all these cathedrals. It, it did basically three things. It saved material. It also looked very attractive, and it let lots of light flood in from the sides. Of course, lots of people wonder how they built arches. Very simple, really. You make a wooden framework or centering and build round it. Then take the frame away, and if it's been built right, the arch will stay in place without the wooden support. Success! <laughs> <laughs> the more courses of brick or stone you build on top of this, and the more weight that goes on it, the more solid the whole thing becomes. At least that's the theory. I'm going to attempt to sit on top of it and see what happens. Here we go. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> 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 Just <be> <laughs> Well, as you can see, that was an arch down at ground level. Bit of a disaster, really, but at least you get the basic idea of the principle of building an arch. I mean, really, if I'd have used a bit more cement in the mortar, it would have actually stayed up. But. I mean, just behind me up there, how did they go about building them? Like three tiers of arches. People sometimes think that these early builders had no machines to help them, but that's not so. Peterborough has a great windlass or winding engine which was left in place inside the roof when it was being built. Up here, I've got somebody who can tell us all about this wonderful piece of machinery. And, and this is Zachary over here, who's an expert in medieval engines and winching machines. Now then, Zachary, tell us, you know, all about this is your beautiful model that you've made, isn't it, of this particular thing behind us? Yes, thank you. It's known as a windlass, mm -hmm. and I, I might suggest that it's really a hoist. Mm. The windlass would have a vertical spindle, mm. which was rotated yeah, to all like an oars gin. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm. Whereas this is a hoist, but we can call it a windlass and mm. oblige the... Uh, the people in the past have called it mm. that. Um, my idea was that as the wheel rotates, the wheel being 10 feet in diameter approximately, mm -hmm. and the shaft is about a foot in mm -hmm. diameter, mm -hmm. means that you have a 10 to 1 ratio. Now that means that a 12 stone man would effectively be able to raise 1500 weights. And because of the principle of the rope going through the block and tackle over the weight, then back up to what I think was used, the ring anchor, mm -hmm. 
then that would double again the efficiency, which means that the 12 stone man now could lift 30 hundredweights, one and a half tons. Such a person, I've calculated, could lift that weight uh, to 100 feet in about a quarter of an hour. And then he would need a rest. <laughs> a uh, crack a bottle of wine or something like that. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. I suppose uh, when you look at the at the real thing, like it, it's obvious, like you said, they, you pull it apart pretty quick, could not they? And you could, because all of the joints were doweled mm. and nailed, mm. so it would have been easy to dismantle and move to yeah. another part. Mm. Three mm. chaps could take that apart in 15 yeah. minutes mm. and take it to another part of yeah. the wall mm. to build it. Yes, because yeah, they won't want to be uh, moving these things when they've got them up there too far horizontally, would exactly. they? Exactly. No, they, it'd be hard to yeah, move. Yeah, they, they want to be getting them sat on the mortar pretty quick. <laughs> Absolutely. By the time the great Norman cathedrals were being built, it was also a, a time of great change in the building industry. New methods and, and ways of doing things. And of course, the, the rib vaulting were a, quite a new invention, you know. And of course, it's very strong. And here at Peterborough, were one of the first places where they actually used it. It's basically a couple of arches that come together in the centre, like the half-completed one I've got here in my garden. In order to build a, a, a groin ceiling or a groin roof out of stone, first of all, you needed the centering. That's what this is here. And the centering, of course, is two wooden arches, one leaning on the other one. And, of course, when you started to lay the masonry around the bottom, it was important that you kept it same height all the way around, so the weight on the, uh, the centering stayed basically the same, as you might say. The next bit is the exciting bit. I'm going to knock this block of wood from underneath the centering and hopefully the, the centering will fall out, you know, or fall down and hopefully the arch will stay where it should do, stay stood up. Here goes. There it is, almost half a perfect groin roof. And just to prove how strong it really is, this is a 56 pound weight, which I'm going to stick on the top. How's that? See, I mean, it's only two inches thick, but it's all in that. You know, in real terms, it'd be a few hundred tons, I should imagine. Growing it like this would take the weight of the walls above and give them added support. If you study the stonework, there's all sorts of interesting things that you can see. And just behind me here, you know, I found this unbelievable mistake that were made. Up about four or five feet from the edge of the parapet, there's this series of five stones with semicircular notches in, which if you study a bit below where the, the arches with the pillars below, obviously these stones were cut to have something to do with that and yet weren't needed, so... They put D-shaped filling in pieces in and, and worked them into the wall above. It's quite obvious that the economy were the top of the list and they didn't really waste a lot. The huge scale and solidity of a cathedral like Peterborough is a symbol of the Norman idea that the church was a powerful agent of state control. So it's no surprise that they built some of their greatest cathedrals in centres of Anglo-Saxon resistance to their rule. In the years immediately after the conquest, some parts of the country held out longer than others. The East Anglian Fenlands was one of these, and here Saxon rebels waged a guerrilla war against the Normans. Once they were defeated, the Normans wanted to make sure it wouldn't happen again. So what they built here was a massive demonstration of their power and authority. Norman Ely was an enormous fortress cathedral over 500 feet long and 200 feet high, which took 37 years to complete. This magnificent tower is almost like a Norman keep. It's complete with battlements and it's over 200 feet high and it dominates the whole area and you can actually see for miles from up here. 
You hardly needed a castle when you got a cathedral like this. Like Peterborough, Ely is one of our best preserved Norman cathedrals, but one of the things I find particularly interesting here is the effect that alterations and additions made by later builders had on the original Norman structure, like the tower for instance. The tower is even taller now than it was when the Normans first built it, because 300 years later they erected this magnificent octagonal shaped bell chamber behind me. It sits on top of the old Norman structure, dominating the landscape. The only problem was those later medieval engineers didn't do their calculations very well because the alterations to the tower put a massive extra weight on the old Norman foundations. They realised that the original walls weren't strong enough to take all this extra weight, so they put a sort of stone skin inside the original tower. It's quite ingenious, really, and if you look down, you can see how they reinforced the new arches to take the strain. The main body of Ely Cathedral was built over a period of a hundred years. You can see how the way it was built changed over this time, as the Normans improved their techniques and moved on from the round arch to the pointed Gothic version. Like, really, the big difference in between, like, the Norman arch and the, and the Gothic or the pointed arch is the fact that the Norman one, the thrust went sideways and you needed much greater weight in the abutments or the walls of the building that the thing were in. The pointed arch, of course, goes straight down, you know, the weight and very little pressure sideways. I mean, if you go in some of the the gothic sort of style cathedrals and, and look how slender everything is, the pillars that support the pointed arches and then you go in a Norman one and, and see how chunky everything is, you can see it were a great advance in, in architecture. When most people think of cathedrals, you think of stonemasons, but there's a bit more to it than that. There were, there were as many joiners, I would rather think, of stonemasons. And they would come into various categories, you know, the carpenters did the, the rough stuff, like all the centering for the arches, and of course the joiners did the finer bits, you know, like carving all the beautiful bullions. And of course, not to mention the plumbers, also the lead roof and all the downspouts, all of them would be made more or less on site, you know, with the lead burners. And of course, stonemasons who did all the lovely tracery for the windows. And then the other branch would be the, the rough guys who did the infill in the walls, you see. And of course, down here on this grass at that time, it would be an hive of industry. There would be quite a few wooden sheds that the, the craftsmen had actually made the cell to uh, protect the cell from the rain and the, and the weather and the elements. There'd be a bit like castles, building season. When sun come out in summer, they'd all be happy and crashing away up there on the walls, but in winter, I suppose, they spent most of the time underneath the roof down here, chiselling beautiful tops for columns and things of that nature. Basically, the stonemason's craft involves two types of work. There's the sort of geometric masonry that I'm having to go at, which is very disciplined and follows definite lines. Pieces of stone like this go straight into the building. But if there's any embellishments to do, like faces, flowers or leaves, then it goes into the carver's workshop. And when you look closely, you can see that the whole building is filled with their intricate handiwork. The reason that made all this possible was the rapid improvements being made in metalwork, and especially in the blacksmithing department. They made better tools with better cutting edges, which enabled stonemasons and the joinery department to do much finer work. All the fancy tracery and everything were much easier worked with better steel in the tools. It enabled the joiners and carpenters to make really graceful centres for building all them beautiful groin ceilings. 
know that more resistant types of stone and more durable wood could be used. The cathedral builders could design columns that were narrower and more graceful looking. The sculptors and carvers were able to do finer and more delicate designs. It was the great age of cathedral building and it created master craftsmen who were capable of pushing the boundaries of their craft to new limits. And this is the greatest masterpiece. In 1322, the central tower collapsed, destroying the Norman choir. But instead of rebuilding the tower, the cathedral bursar, Alan of Walsingham, designed an octagon to replace it. It was an amazing feat of engineering that began with the building of eight huge stone pillars over a hundred feet high. But the biggest challenge they faced was the fact that the roof over this space needed to let in the light. And this is the solution they came up with, the lantern. It was designed by William Early, King Edward III's master carpenter, and it took 14 years to build. To really appreciate what keeps all this lot up here, you've got to view it from the inside. This wonderful octagonal shaped lantern at Ely Cathedral, this, you know, weighing over 200 tons of wood and lead and sort of just hanging over precariously over this great void. This really is my personal idea of how they managed to get it up all them years ago. These beams here, they're the, really the main ones and the horizontal one down below it. And the joint there is just an half lap joint. That one must have been the first joint that they made down below in, in, the, in the field at the bottom. They would obviously bring this great, I don't know, 50 foot long block of oak in at the bottom and raise it up and then stand it on the corbel or in the slot down there in the dark and have it leaning out at this jaunty handle. There'd be maybe 50 or 60 blocks, you know, on the end of the rope that control the actual set of rope blocks that raise the, the real weight of the thing. And, of course, as it came up, it'd have other guy ropes on and men pulling the bottom out and the, keeping the top roughly in the right shop. And when they got it in a position where they could anchor it to the stonework, the, the next stage of the game would be everybody would be holding onto the ropes while... Some intrepid character crept out onto the stonework and shoved in the big iron pin. This would have to be sort of repeated eight times all the way around the... or 16 times, really, because there's, there's two for every corner. And, of course, the next piece would come up in the same manner with the rope box, with the aid of a couple of planks chucked out on, on here for somebody to go out on. It'd be pretty easy to secure the corner there and then construct what I've called the foundation ring for the lantern proper. At this point, they could lay down the cross members. These, I rather think, are inserted to stop the whole thing twisting. All of these that have been marked out and tenoned down on terra firma, down on floor, you can see all the carpenter's scribe marks where the things have all, where they all slot in. So when it arrived up here, they didn't get it wrong way around. Once they got the bottom part of the frame in place, they would be able to get the eight vertical posts for the lantern itself in position right in the centre and then secure it with another ring at the top. They'd reached a stage of stability where they'd realised the thing couldn't collapse. Up until then, it must have been very precarious. Really, when you think it weighs 200 tonnes and it were done all them years ago, it's a credit to them men. Who, you know, a lot of them couldn't even read or write, you know, but they, they had it somehow or other. All done to the glory of God.
In Norman times, the church was very powerful. And the bishops, not only were they the builders, but they were the warriors as well. And there's nowhere better than you can see this here at Rochester, where the cathedral is almost built in the grounds of the castle. Many of the greatest castle builders in the country were bishops, and they helped William the Conqueror stamp his authority on the land with the power of God as well as the sword. Rochester Castle was built by William de Corbe, Archbishop of Canterbury, and it is the largest keep or tower in England with walls 113 feet high. If you look behind me, you'll see that Rochester Castle has got three square towers and one round one. The round one, of course, on this corner. Now, down at the museum, they have a wonderful model that explains the reason why. In 1215, King John held siege to Rochester Castle, but it only lasted for five weeks, and here's the reason why. While the battle raged above, King John's men dug a tunnel uh, from no doubt a safe distance uh, to undermine the tower on the corner, the South Tower. A thing that, you know, I've done myself many times, underpinning a large tower or a chimney stack. When I was pulling something down, I always used to follow exactly the same procedure. I nearly always won, as King John's men did. The thing is here, you can see in great detail on this model exactly what they did. You know, the, the tunnel that they've dug is only a few feet below the surface, uh, hence the excessive amount of props holding up the, the, the fields and the sods and whatever the other soil. Once they got to the base of the uh, tower, reputedly they burned the fat of 40 pigs on the, on the pit props to uh, make them burn a bit better. The order has obviously been given to retreat. The, the fire's now raging. There's a man there with a stick with a fire on top of it like a torch. It was quite exciting. There's always that constant worry as to is it going to fall down or is it not? In this case, it all did come tumbling down. Unlike my tower, the keepers of wall were so strong it stayed standing. It was taken over by the new king, Henry III, after John's death, who turned it into a royal castle and built the round tower that we see today. Sadly, the keep is an empty shell today, but when it was first built, it was a magnificent statement of Norman power. The castles and cathedrals that the Normans built transformed the face of England and the way the country looked changed just as fundamentally as the way it was ruled. Buildings like this helped the Norman conquerors to establish themselves, bringing a stability and permanence to the country that united England under one monarchy. Next week I'll be going to Wales to look at the art of medieval castle building and we'll discover how an English king and a French architect changed the way castles were built forever. If you'd like to find out more about the building of Britain, then why not visit the website at bbc.co.uk slash history.